Okay, so last month was a little bit slow, but this month I have a lot of really interesting new projects to release, an interview with Ed Domino, the physician who first administered ketamine to a human being, as well as an interview with Carl Hart and several other things that I've already recorded. But right now I'm going to release a discussion with a pharmacologist at the University of Florida named Oliver Grundman, who conducted the largest Kratom consumer study thus far in 2017. He's published numerous papers on Kratom. He's an expert on the subject. And so it's a discussion with him about his research. And I'm joined by Soren Shade, who's actually been on this podcast twice previously in past production updates because he was a producer on the third season of Pharmacopoeia. And the reason that Soren is coming into this discussion is because after Pharmacopoeia, he started a Kratom tea company called Top Tree. And I personally am not a user of Kratom, but I went to the lab where they're doing all of the quality control and analysis on this product. They test for heavy metals. They do chemical analysis. It's ethically sourced. It's a good product if you use Kratom. And another thing that I like about it is that instead of it being an extract or a powder capsule, it's a tea bag. And so it's a slightly different way of preparing Kratom as a aqueous infusion, which is actually the way I first used it and was probably one of the um, uh, rare, very positive experiences that I've had with the plant was a, a strained aqueous infusion. Um, so it's a cool product. But what I really like is that Soren and Dr. Grundman are collaborating on a survey to try to gather basic information about Kratom. You know, it's it's kind of bizarre to think that we know so much about the chemistry and molecular neuropharmacology of kratom alkaloids and very simple questions like, what's the average age of an American kratom user are more difficult to answer. So that's why these surveys are really important. It helps gather information that way, if there is some kind of regulatory challenge or the next time they attempt to prohibit it, you can point to peer-reviewed scientific literature and say, look, there are, you know, 2,000 people responded to the survey. They feel that it offers this or that benefit. Or if negative things are reported, then the industry can, I hope, change their practices accordingly to try to mitigate some of those negative effects. So I think it's really good to do these surveys. I took the survey myself. It took me 10 minutes. It's easy. But what's really nice, uh, especially when you consider the fact that this is a, a plant that's being used in countless different ways. You have extracts. You have plants from different geographical regions that have different alkaloid concentrations. You have uh, various alcohol infusions. You have... Um, who knows? I mean, you also have these weird unregulated products that are uh, adulterated with synthetic opioids. You have all sorts of different things. So one nice thing about the survey is that every person that buys Top Tree gets a link to the survey and a subcategory of respondents can specify where they got it. That way you can know precisely, at least for that subcategory of respondents what percentage are having this or that positive or negative effect so i think it's a good thing to do and i definitely support this effort to gather basic knowledge about the plant um, i'm also linking a another survey totally unrelated that's being set up by imperial college london on 5meo dmt and the idea is anyone who is planning on consuming 5meo dmt either synthetic material, I hope, or uh, Bufoil Various Venom, I think you know how I feel about that, um, that you participate in the survey to gather more basic information about your motivations and things like that. I haven't taken that particular survey because I'm not planning to use either synthetic 5-MeO DMT or Bufoil Various Venom anytime in the near future, but if you are, I will link that in the description of this podcast. And yeah, I think the discussion is really interesting. Um, we talk about 
all of the different attributes and problems associated with Kratom, including uh, the difficulty of figuring out what the correct pronunciation is, uh, Kratom or Kratom, I've given up at this point and just call it Kratom, but then there's another tier in the pronunciation of metragenine versus mitragynine. It's a complicated plant, so maybe this will help uh, answer some questions and generate some more knowledge. I hope you enjoy the discussion. So just to summarize, what it, you're, you're working on a, a new survey now? Yes. Uh, so pleasure to meet you first, uh, Hamilton. Huh. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, so we actually currently working, we, we completed um, the second survey, an international survey on Kratom users recently, um, well, recently dates back to 2020. Uh, and uh, prior to that, I completed uh, one survey that was primarily based in the United States. Uh, so we hope to see some differences uh, in an international survey that also included uh, participants from Malaysia and from Indonesia in terms of more traditional uses of, of Kratom versus uh, primarily a, a US user-based survey. Uh, and uh, now we're working on a particular survey um, a new survey, uh, particularly associated with uh, users that use a defined amount of kratom that is uh, delivered in a tea form, in, in a tea bag form. Uh, so that allows for uh, more of a uh, uh, dosing uh, based form of kratom versus just loose um, powder or loose. Um, just uh, uh, Kratom products that are not well defined. And how are you distributing the survey? It will be distributed online and anonymous. So folks will not be able to be identified uh, so they can feel comfortable in actually answering uh, the questions in a format that they feel comfortable um, answering them. Sometimes also related to uh, potentially using other drugs concomitantly with Kratom or uh, related to prior opioid use, uh, because we know that um, some folks have been using Kratom to mitigate opioid withdrawal symptoms, for example. Right. And have you decided how the survey itself is actually going to be distributed, like what website it will be on or where it will be hosted? <laughs> So at the University of Florida, we have a, we use Qualtrics as a survey delivery platform, uh, which has several layers of um, security, I would say, to also protect both the ones that answer the survey, as well as adhere to uh, institutional review board requirements, um, IRB uh, requirements. Uh, so uh, that is intended to protect both those who are taking the survey as well as maintain data integrity and data security. So that is where we will deliver the survey uh, and the distribution will be maintained through those who are actually selling the product. Yeah, I think it's really valuable and interesting to do these sorts of surveys, but I, I always wonder what sorts of biases they contain in terms of selecting for a more self-aware analytical user who would be interested in taking a survey in the first place or who even thinks about their own use. Do you think that um, that there's some bias there in terms of the sorts of people that care enough about their use of Kratom to report on it in some way? Oh, yes, definitely. There's no, no, no question about that. And I think that is a limitation of these surveys. Um, the issue at the moment is that we cannot conduct uh, actual human trials on Kratom in the United States uh, because of the limitations that the FDA imposes on Kratom. And we have not had a chance to get Kratom trials approved uh, in the United States, Kratom human clinical trials in the United States. This is something that will probably happen in some years to come. But in the meantime, we are really getting a lot of information from current Kratom users. It is selective, it is biased, there's no question about it. Uh, but what we have seen in collaboration with, for example, Kirsten Smith, who is currently a postdoc at NIDA at the National Institutes on Drug Abuse, is 
that when we look at Reddit user uh, forums, um, they are obviously less biased in, uh, in their opinions and what they post. And they have done uh, kind of crawling through some of that data on Kratom. And we are now publishing a, uh, an article on how they report their experiences using Kratom, both for opioid withdrawal symptoms, as well as some of their experiences with dependence development in, in regards to Kratom use, which has been reported in the literature as well. And that kind of aligns actually, some of that overlaps with what we see with some of the surveys, uh, as well as some unique experiences in terms of adverse effects and dependence development from Kratom use. Right. And one thing that I had, I made a, a short documentary about Kratom years ago. And one of the things that I experienced as a real problem reporting on it responsibly was disentangling the political dimensions from what was, you know, basic toxicological or psychopharmacological problems. So you have people that are aware that we live in this country with a long history of prohibition and they are driving some benefit from this plant and they desperately don't want it to be prohibited. And so they're basically concocting a false narrative to only talk about the positive sides of the plant because they're so afraid that if they acknowledge anything negative about it, that it will result in prohibition and the medicine will be taken away from them. So they say, it's not a drug, it's not an opioid, it's not addictive or whatever. And is that something that you've thought about? Because it, I did notice that there's a quite a bit of, it's, it's dishonesty but I understand why they're being dishonest. It's a sort of realistic uh, reflection of the legal environment that we live in, where it's there are serious costs attached to being honest about why you use certain psychoactive substances and what the real effect of those substances might be. So definitely, I think that Kratom has its benefits and its detriments mm -hmm. and its adverse effects. And we clearly see in some of these surveys when users report how much Kratom they use per dose and with what frequency they use Kratom, that there is an increase. There's a dose response relationship when it comes to adverse effects. Uh, and also a higher uh, risk of uh, dependence development uh, to Kratom itself with higher doses, with higher frequency of use. Uh, so it would be um, irresponsible for anybody who um, does research on Kratom to say that Kratom is just innocuous and let's just, you know, pretend that nothing can happen if you use Kratom. Uh, so I think it is important to point out that um, Kratom labeling uh, should be uh, adhering to certain standards, that Kratom products that are out there should adhere to certain quality standards, um, that there should be certain requirements uh, imposed on those who manufacture and sell Kratom products. Um, so uh, with, with any drug that is available, no matter if it's a synthetic drug or if it's a natural product, um, there are benefits and adverse effects that are associated with its use. And I think we need to point that out and need to make people aware of it. Yes. Yeah. Because you may have seen there's a subreddit called quitting Kratom or quitting Kratom and, and it's filled with people who are just really bothered by the false narrative because they feel like they got sucked into this because everyone was saying that it wasn't a drug or that it wasn't an opioid or it didn't have abuse potential and then they kind of got themselves into a problematic use pattern and it's a very precarious position because you don't want to you want to acknowledge all of the good things about it because especially in the realm of opioids i think it's pretty clear that this is an extraordinary plant that has tremendous advantages over um, really anything else out there in terms of something that can be accessed by the common person um, so it's it's a difficult balance 
Yeah, and I think anybody who self-treats an opioid use disorder or any substance use disorder is runs the risk of developing, basically substituting one substance with another, always runs the risk of developing a new dependence to that new substance. And therefore, I think it is important that such people seek the help of a professional that can assist them in that journey. Um, if that is their trusted healthcare professional, or if it is a, 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 a clinic um, that can benefit them, uh, I think it is important that they have somebody at their site that assists them through that journey. Um, just self-treatment, you run the risk of uh, either substituting one substance for another um, and therefore just, you know, that's what we do basically with methadone and buprenorphine. We switch somebody from one substance to another within a legal setting. Now they are basically dependent on another substance in a legal setting, which is great, which is a first great step. And some folks then remain basically dependent on that drug for the rest of their life. Uh, so <laughs> uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not arguing that we are, uh, that Kratom is the magical be all end all uh, to, to the solutions of, for some of these people. And I think they need to seek help and should not rely on Kratom to solve their problems. Right, <clears throat> right. Um, which I think is um, is a very good lead into like why your survey is um, so important, why I'm looking forward to it when it comes to tea preparation, because I think a, a lot of the um, the negative side effects or the toxicity that we've you know been talking about um, can be related to the formula or the preparation of the kratom and how it's being taken and of course the dose and the extracts um, and just seeing the use pattern that's around um, tea versus um, consuming powder at up to 20 grams a day um, we'll be able to um, isolate some of these factors a little bit better in terms of the prevalence of the withdrawal or the addictive aspects of it in the same way that you would likely see less withdrawal symptoms from a regular green tea drinker versus someone who's taking 600 milligrams of encapsulated caffeine every day. And I think these surveys are very important for um, bring, you know, just bringing, pulling more data in regards to this aspect of um, how one consumes it. Well, yeah, definitely. I think what, what is important here to note is if somebody basically drinks this powder uh, that they make a slur out of uh, mm -hmm. is that they are not getting like just a water extraction uh, that you would get with a tea bag when you drink peppermint tea or when you drink green tea, what you mentioned, uh, Soren. Uh, but you also get this slur, this kind of uh, often, which is very bitter, by the way. So it's not very pleasant to drink at all. Um, and, and that obviously contributes to a whole host of, of other issues uh, uh, that you potentially cannot predict very well what you actually ingest, um, contributing to uh, an unpredictable nature overall of what you actually ingest and what is being absorbed by your body overall. Whereas with a water extraction, uh, an infusion, uh, which is a tea extraction, wa hot water extraction, you get a much more controlled um, absorption of uh, and ingestion of what you actually ingest. Yeah, no, I think it's it's unfortunate that there isn't more appreciation of things like that in our sort of folk understanding of the way drugs work, because, you know, the probably the best example is cocaine, where um, I even made a, a short piece about a psychiatrist in Peru years ago, who was doing psychosurgery on cocaine addicts, where he was removing part of their cingulate gyrus and was having these sort of miraculous results. But then there was a outcry against it. And they said, this is unethical. You can't perform psychosurgery on addicts. So he had to find a different way of treating cocaine addiction. And he found that uh, just giving the cocaine addicts coca tea was as effective as cingulotomy. So it's uh it's amazing how just changing the route of administration and changing the dosing frequency can have this profound therapeutic effect um and that's of course a big part of the the rare instances of 
fatal overdoses as well, like poly drug intoxication aside, it's not, it's certainly not people chewing fresh leaves or making a tea. It's people that are consuming enormous, enormous quantities of extracts or powder in some, I mean, the one that I was aware of was someone that was sort of molding the powder into a, like a bar and then eating huge quantities of the raw powder in these like bars that he had made. Um, is that your interpretation of the instances of, of severe toxicity and fatal overdose? So I, I have been uh, involved a little bit in, in this on, on the sidelines, admittedly. Uh, so what, from what I have seen, the 46 plus um, fatal overdoses where mitragynin was reported in the postmortem blood of, uh, of these unfortunate deaths, it was primarily, as you said, it was poly drug exposures. And I think there was to date two cases where only mitragynin was detected remains a little bit questionable if all of the analysis, you know, if all of the drugs were actually tested for or not. But that aside, yes, uh, it was huge doses usually that were taken. So we're not talking about the average users that were taking three to five grams per dose and maybe three times per day it was really heavy, heavy, heavy kratom use. And usually then in combination with, with other drugs. Um, so if mitragynin was causative or if kratom was causative in these deaths is still to my to my mind very questionable um and i think we we don't we cannot tell if, because from from most animal studies questionable how that translates into the human um we, we didn't we didn't see acute toxicity you can dose it quite highly in terms of kratom and mitragynin um and and the animals do not die. They, they don't experience a respiratory depression as we see with classical opioids. Now you see certain signs of, of opioid toxicity, definitely. You see constipation, uh, you see uh, hypotension. So I'm, mm. like you said, you, you definitely have to be careful because it is still acting on opioid receptors. So it is an opioid in that sense, but you don't see the respiratory depression that's associated with classical opioids. So uh you need to dose it quite high and then it's likely that uh it is in working in conjunction with other uh substances and for someone that doesn't know about the pharmacology of metragenine why is it that it's so safe compared to something like morphine or heroin or fentanyl what is it that because we have this idea culturally that opioids of any kind are this high toxicity pharmacological class that are associated with death. And yet you have this glaring exception that's being used throughout the country that is uh, seemingly, you know, safer than probably acetaminophen. And um, why is that? Why is it so much safer? So uh, the hypothesis or what we currently proposing from the literature and I've been Andrew Krugel and Chris McCurdy at my own institution who have done some uh, molecular studies and also in vitro and in vivo studies that seem to confirm that is that uh, these indole alkaloids, mitragynin and alike are binding to opioid receptors um, and they bind as partial agonists. So they do not activate all of the receptors that they bind to when we talk about mu opioid receptors. Um, in contrast to morphine, which is a full agonist, so it activates all of the uh, opioid receptors that it binds to. Um, and they also show what is called a biased signaling. Um, so basically, once they activate the receptor, there's, there are two pathways that are being activated. And what we always focus on when we talk about these G protein coupled receptors is the G protein pathway which leads to CAMP, which is a second intracellular um, signaling pathway, which then leads to some intracellular uh, changes that ultimately then can lead to protein expression and all of these things. Uh, but there's also a second pathway, which is the beta arrestin 2 pathway. And this pathway seems to be associated uh, with some of the negative uh, effects 
like respiratory depression, like uh, more pronounced uh, constipation, uh, as well as uh, some of the dependence development um, that is associated with it. Now, we, we haven't worked that out entirely, to be honest, because we obviously still see that kratom overall leads to, in high doses, to dependence. It can still cause constipation. There is some respiratory depression, but not as severe as we see with morphine and other classical opioids. Um, so this this kind of bias signaling um, might not apply to all of the alkaloids that are present in, um, in, in Kratom. And we haven't worked that out entirely for all of them. Right, right. Is, is that not the case for 7-hydroxymetragenin? So 7-hydroxymetragenin, um, and I go back between mitragynin and mitragynin, so I apologize sometimes. I get wrapped up in it. <laughs> um, uh, it's, uh, it, it, it actually shows, uh, in, although there is only this one hydroxyl uh, that is added uh, on the, on the, between the indole and, and uh, <laughs> in this complex structure, uh, it, it actually shows uh, it can replace morphine. Uh, it, it can provide the same response when you train uh, a, a, a rat on, on morphine, uh, make them morphine dependent, so to say, uh, it can replace morphine, uh, whereas mitragynin cannot replace morphine seeking behavior. Um, so there is something with 7-hydroxy uh, mitragynin uh, that has acts similar to morphine in, in, in its seeking behavior, in its replacement behavior, uh, which mitragynin does not. And we do not fully understand why that is the case. Although it also seems to be biased, it seems to present with a biased signaling pathway. So we do not fully understand why that is the case. It seems to be related to potentially uh, sub-receptor opioid receptor selectivity. So a difference in mu opioid versus kappa and delta opioid receptor selectivity. And am I correct in understanding that 7-hydroxymetragenine is both naturally occurring in the plant and a human metabolite of metragenine? Correct, yes. So we, we, we're not exactly certain that it is actually naturally occurring. It might actually occur, and, and that's just a hypothesis. It's not complete, we're not completely sure if it happens, if it actually is occurring as a uh, byproduct of the drying process, if it is actually in the fresh leaf. If you just pick it, and you chew it as it's done traditionally, uh, and you get kind of this brief stimulant burst. Um, if that is actually, if 7-hydroxy is still in there, or if it's, or if it's just a byproduct of the drying process. Uh, and then it is definitely a human um, metabolite. So it's, it's generated through SIP enzymes. Um, uh, and we think that it has to do with much of the opioid analgesic effects, but it might also be another yet not fully understood process that is another oxindole uh, metabolite of mitragynin that might also contribute to uh, some of the pharmacological effects of kratom. Do you know what that other metabolite is? Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it just came out, the publication just came out. Pseudo-indoxyl? It's a pseudoendoxyl. Uh, it's mitragynin pseudoendoxyl um, me me metabolite that is generated through esterases in the blood. So it's not generated through uh, SIP enzymes. Um, mm. uh, it's it's, but it's not yet fully confirmed if that is stronger acting than mitragynin or 7-hydroxymitragynin. We, we're not yet certain. Right. And I think that the issue of, of prodrugs and active metabolites is one of the most complicated aspects of opioid pharmacology because, you know, there's a sort of, uh, it, you know, it, it's considered like a basic fact, at least in terms of what I've learned in pharmacology, that two drugs, all else equal, the drug that has the slower onset will have lower abuse potential than the one with the faster onset and one of the longer duration will have lower abuse potential than the one with the shorter duration. And so when you have a drug that has 
uh, a, a primary active metabolite that seems like in some sense it's desirable because it's going to reduce the rapidity of the onset of the opioid action. And that is why uh, I imagine why in many countries, codeine can be sold over the counter, even though it's really just a morphine prodrug and morphine is not over the counter anywhere on earth. Um, and the same is true of tramadol, which wasn't even a controlled substance in the United States until, I don't know, five years ago or something like that, um, which is a basically a prodrug for O-desmethyl tramadol. Um, but there's a lot of people, uh, experts on opioids. There's a, a physician named David Yerlink. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but he's a, kind of a, an interesting opioid pharmacologist and physician. And he's very much against prodrugs pro-drug opioids because he thinks that you're then uh, leaving the activation of the substance up to some genetically determined metabolic whim that could be completely different between users. Have you seen any evidence that people from different, uh, like different parts of the world or different types of cytochrome enzymes metabolize metragenine differently? So we haven't seen that in humans yet, but we have seen in, in rat studies because we know the metabolic pathway of mitragynin that CYP2D6 might actually be one of these candidates because we know about uh, genomic differences uh, in that expression, that they are fast metabolizers, ultra rapid metabolizers, um, and also slow metabolizers of CYP2D6, that they are isoforms um, that might metabolize mitragynin uh, differently. Um, so that might lead itself to different effects um, that quartum can have. Now we have to be aware, we only looking, we only talking about mit mitragynin at the moment. And mitragynin might be the most abundant alkaloid, but there's obviously more to quartum than just mitragynin. And, it, it seems to be very clear that the overall effects that a user is experiencing from Quartum are not solely attributable to just this one molecule, to just this one substance. And I think the focus has been so much on mitragynin that we might be sometimes losing a little bit sight of, you know, there's much more to, uh, to kratom than just the mitragynin. And I understand that because mitragynin is abundant, is the most abundant alkaloid, um, that this is where the research is at the moment. But I think the overall picture of kratom should not get entirely lost in this mix. Yeah, which um, which made me very curious to um, uh, to ask about um, one of the other uh, alkaloids that you had brought to my attention in an email, um, Dr. Grunman, which is rhinophylline. Which, what I, if I'm pronouncing that right, I um, I saw a very short Wikipedia article before this that said it was a selective NMDA antagonist and partial calcium ion channel blocker. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What other research um, or, or knowledge do you have on, on rhicophylline? Because it it's, it's just amazes me what all these mitragenine scaffold um, in, in do, or naturally occurring um, alkaloids and, and kratom are capable of and, and how they affect so many different receptor types. So at the moment, we, we don't know much about it, to be honest. Uh, we know it's, it's primarily actually uh, present in uh, Euticaria uh, species, so completely unrelated species. Um, and uh, we're we doing some preliminary research at the moment in, in worms, which is a good replacement uh, for higher uh, mammalian species. Uh, so we're looking at it more from the perspective of what else is in uh, in kratom uh, that might actually contribute to its pharmacological effects. Because I am really, when we look at so many other uh, uh, natural uh, extracts that are out there or natural products that are out there. Think about St. John's word, think about um, kava or something like that. We, we're not extracting just hyperforin or hypericin from St. John's word uh, to give the, the, the single ingredient. We're using still the, the actual extract or we're using still the, the actual natural herb or whatever part of the plant we're using. Uh, because we 
we know that they are working together often, either if it's increased oral bioavailability of the active compounds or something like that, right? So I think that we cannot, and, and especially with, with Kratom, we know at, at low exposure amounts or short brief exposure, chewing on it, taking low amounts, it has stimulant effects. At high exposure amounts, longer, letting it steam longer, lower infusion, <laughs> uh, longer infusion times, water extraction, it has more of an analgesic or sedative effect. So there, there, I, I don't think we can attribute it all to just mitragynin. I think there has to be more to it. So uh, that's why we're looking at different compounds, not only alkaloids, but primarily other alkaloids as well. Right. It's so complicated when you have a plant with so <laughs> many different compounds that's used in so many different ways. I mean, do you think that the difference between the traditional use is so great that, you know, like you mentioned that the seven hydroxy metragenine could even be just a, a product of drying and aging the plant, which is something that isn't even done traditionally, at least in Thailand, where I saw it, uh, maybe it is in other places. So do you think that it's so different that you can't even compare these sorts of, of use? the use of a farmer chewing a fresh leaf versus somebody buying it at a store and taking a, a, I mean, it seems like you could be getting completely different um, compounds depending on the age, depending on the way it's extracted. And it could be a very different experience as well. I think there's definitely uh, different experiences uh, that you can, or different effects that you can get uh, from a, a dried, uh, kratom uh, product uh, versus the fresh leaf. And we see that with a number of different uh, natural products, again, where either we enrich uh, the, the active proposed active ingredients or the known active ingredients. Um, uh, uh, so I, I think there, there is a, there's a good potential that that is the case here as well with kratom. Um, do we still, can we still uh, get benefits from either use? Yes, I think so. Um, I think that the traditional use that we observe in Thailand and Malaysia or Indonesia um, definitely points us to, uh, to uses uh, and, uh, and uh, benefits of Kratom that we can observe here in the United States as well. And that's what the survey data tells us uh, as much as that is associated with limitations. Uh, I think that people are not that biased in that they would give us completely false data in, in their reporting, uh, not you know among 5,000 or 6,000 responses that we get from, from survey data. Uh, but I think it is, it is, it is a distinctly different, um, different effect uh, range that we see from from the dried plant material versus the fresh plant material. Yes. And in terms of, you know, when we talk about treatment of opioid dependence, it's hard to talk about it in a purely pharmacological way, because you have all these legal medical factors that come into play. But if you were to remove all of that, just based on your reading and your research, how does you know, some, some of the major things that I've seen people using, you have methadone, obviously, is the sort of the traditional, then you have buprenorphine, which has become far more popular in recent years, then you have use of different kratom preparations. And for a while, it seemed that it was very popular for people to use high dose loperamide. Um, again, that was partially due to the legality, but also it seemed to have a somewhat uh, it seemed to be effective for many people to the point that manufacturers stopped selling large bottles of loperamide because they were selling so frequently for people that had opioid dependence problems that they were trying to wean off using loperamide that they like changed the market. You know, it used to be on Amazon that you could buy these 500 tablet bottles. And now those are, are I think they're five times the price that they used to be. Um, so just based on these different strategies that you've encountered, how does, uh, the use of a Kratom product line up? What are the advantages or disadvantages? So if I compare 
what Kratom currently, what Kratom products are being sold on the, on the market at the moment. There's, there's a huge range of products and you, it's like in some regards comparing apples to oranges, right? Uh, we have these highly concentrated um, extracts uh, that contain, that are really enriched in mitragynin where you have 40, 50% mitragynin in them. Um, and, and I wouldn't call them any longer Kratom uh, extracts because mm. they're almost like pure mitragynin at this point. Uh, uh, and actually uh, some labs use these products to just basically isolate mitragynin because they're already so, so high in mitragynin uh, that uh, you just have to remove what, what little there is left of anything else. And then you have these, these huge variety of, of Kratom products that are out there uh, uh, that are very variable. Uh, it's very hard to, to tell what you actually get when you buy it. Uh, the labels are minimalistic in many ways. Uh, you might get product of Indonesia or sold, you know, imported from Indonesia and not much else on it. And that is in, in my, in my opinion, very irresponsible. That's not, it's not good marketing strategy. I understand that people don't want to uh, be held responsible for anything that they're selling, but um, it's, it's just, it, it, it shouldn't be something that should be legally available if it's, if it's sold like that. Uh, because it, it gives really uh, the consumer not any information on what is actually contained in this product. Uh, and I think, for example, there's the uh, uh, Kratom uh, Consumer Protection Act that has been enacted in some US states uh, where um, uh, basically label requirements are necessary, uh, where dosing uh, is um, uh, something that should be printed on it, um, how many grams should be taken per dose, mm -hmm. um, where uh, a maximum 7-hydroxymetragynin concentration is required. Uh, it should not be sold to minors. Um, so I think that are some good starting points uh, for good manufacturing practices, uh, limiting microbial contamination, uh, limiting um, heavy metal contamination, stuff like that. Um, how does it compare to methadone, buprenorphine? Um, how does it compare to loperamide? Um, so loperamide for me is, is not, that would fall under self-treatment and potentially harmful self-treatment uh, because um, loperamide is obviously not intended to be uh, at all, uh, something that you would take uh, for for mitigating withdrawal symptoms from an opioid use disorder, um, and uh, I don't think it's a safe option. Um, uh, folks might be experimenting with it in various ways, uh, which is to me sounds sounds just insane to to uh, to be uh, to be honest. Um, Kratom has adverse effects. And I think people need to be aware of it um, when they start self-treating an opioid use disorder. Um, I don't think that Kratom by itself, and I, I pointed that out before, um, is, should, be, should be just used in a self-treatment setting to mitigate um, withdrawal symptoms from an opioid use disorder. It should be used under the supervision of a medical professional. Um, and for that purposes, I think we, sh we, should, um, we should be working with uh, medical professional organizations, uh, with uh, regulatory um, uh, agencies to make it available for that purpose. Uh, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a necessary step for that is to have uh, uh, good quality products on the market uh, to make it available for that purpose. I have seen uh, folks uh, that do very well on Kratom to mitigate opioid withdrawal symptoms. And, and we see that over and over again. We hear from folks that are doing really well uh, on, when we talk about Reddit forums, they do very well. 
but we need to be aware that it has a dependence potential, just like methadone or buprenorphine, which can also be abused, and we have seen that as well. So I think it's important that this is done in a, in a responsible setting and responsible manner. Right. And I feel bad that I keep dwelling on negative things. One, and, and I think that, uh, you know, one, there's almost a philosophical question that opioids present. Um, and it's something that Andrew Krugel, at least when I last heard about his work, was having difficulty with, where even if you find that an opioid exerts a really beneficial therapeutic effect, just the idea that it's an opioid is objectionable enough that people are reluctant to invest in it, to use it, to consider it a serious therapeutic option. Opiophobia has spread throughout the country like wildfire, and the word opioid is a bad word. It's a, it's a undesirable mm -hmm. pharmacology. But w the reason that we don't like opioids is because of their potential to have fatal adverse reactions or respiratory depression. Once you strip all of that away, then the question of is it an opioid bad becomes a much more complicated question because we're very comfortable with dependence on other pharmacological classes. There's nothing wrong with being dependent on caffeine. There's nothing wrong with being dependent on nicotine, assuming you're not smoking cigarettes or smoking it at all, um, or maybe not nothing wrong, but it's considered somewhat innocuous by most people. It's routine for people to take SSRIs for depression every single day. It's routine to take a benzodiazepine for insomnia or anxiety. So do you think that this unfortunate legacy of high toxicity opioids has contaminated the therapeutic potential for future opioids that may have tremendous value either as antidepressants or just, you know, uh, safer analgesics or a number of other potentially useful therapies. So uh, I once heard, and I don't know who, who mentioned that, I read it somewhere, and I, I, I apologize to whoever came up with this. Um, substances, no matter if it's a drug or whatever it is, inherently are neither good nor bad. Uh, it is what we attribute to them, uh, what humans attribute to them. And especially before opioids were through marketing schemes, um, just sold like candy or prescribed like candy by doctors um, and pushed by, by manufacturers in the 1990s. Initially, opioids were almost entirely used for cancer pain. And uh, in the, in the mid-1990s, uh, then this expanded with OxyContin, right? OxyContin was like the magic pill uh, that was associated with less uh, abuse potential because of its delayed release action and people cracked that code rather quickly and all of a sudden you had access to this large dose of oxycodone um, and could just ab abuse it, uh, misuse it, abuse it. Um, so opioids, no drug or no substance is inherently bad. It, it's really what people make of it. Um, uh, and, and we try to demonize either people that use it, misuse it or abuse it as the others um, that, you know, can't handle, can't control themselves, um, or we demonize the drugs. Uh, and I think that is a, a profound misconception. We call it the war on drugs. Uh, it's not a war on drugs. It's what our society, what, what, people have done with it, what people are doing with it, continue to do with it, what we as a society do with a problematic drug use. Um, so uh, within that context, opioids have a place in therapy. Um, they have a place in therapy for severe, acute and chronic pain. Uh, and they need to be prescribed to people who need opioids. Uh, we need to be aware of that and we need to educate both prescribers and those who need opioids when it is appropriate to prescribe them. Um, and I think that that requires education uh, for us as, uh, as a society and for those who are prescribing them. At the moment, we are 
like boom, all the way out on one end of the scale and are saying opioids are bad, never, never use them. But I think we need to come back from that and really need to make conscious decisions when opioids are necessary, because we cannot leave somebody who is in the end stages of cancer in pain just because we think, oh, this person in his last days of his or her life might get addicted to an opioid. Who the fuck cares if this person gets addicted <laughs> to an opioid? They will, they will die. They face the end of their life. If they are high on an opioid, let them be high on an opioid for crying out loud. I don't, so what? It's just, it, it is insanity. So that's my, that's my two cents worth on this topic. Yes. And, and of course I agree. Um, but I, I guess more specifically, I think most reasonable people agree that opioids should be prescribed in any kind of end of life palliative care type scenario, unless they're just, you know, uh, sadistic. But in terms of, you know, Andrew Krugel had a TNF team derivative that he had synthesized that induced spinogenesis, and he was trying to get funding to do that. And as I recall, he was having difficulty with it because people were saying, we don't want to fund an antidepressant opioid. That's just not a good idea right now. Politically, it doesn't make sense, even if medically and pharmacologically, it makes sense. So, but of course, once you start stripping away these negative aspects of opioid pharmacology, then you, you have to ask yourself, well, why wouldn't people be using this as an antidepressant if it doesn't kill people or if it doesn't have the same uh, abuse potential as something like fentanyl or morphine? So do you think that in the future, we will basically redefine what an opioid experience is through better opioids? My guess is it is as, is as good as yours in that regard, to be honest, because I think that the term opioid has a very negative connotation right now. I completely agree with that. And anything that acts on opioid receptors right now is it sends like uh, the FDA into a, just a, a, a red light spin and are like, unless it is politically driven or motivated or there's significant um, lobbying behind it, uh, it will not gain market approval. It will not gain any funding from the NIH uh, because it acts on an opioid receptor. Um, if that will be redefined anytime soon, uh, that I think depends on uh, political leadership and so society's drive to become educated on this topic, to, to really see the need for education in regards to how do we fine tune um, opioids to actually benefit people in many regards and not only look at the negative aspects of opioid treatment and opioid use. Yeah. Okay. And I think Soren's product, you know, is probably a really good example. I think that this is, it's very, very unlikely, I imagine, for a tea containing Kratom to exert pretty much any, certainly, I imagine, severe toxicity is just not going to happen, if only because the flavor would prohibit people. <laughs> it's probably not what Soren wants me to say, but it's true. You know, these, there, this is something that is important in terms of traditional use, you know, you don't have tablets, you don't have <laughs> isolated extracts. Mm -hmm. And I really wonder if we would even have had an opioid epidemic if instead of having tablets that people could inject and snort, you had like bitter solutions that people had to drink. I wonder if that in and of itself would have been enough to reduce a lot of the associated problems. It wouldn't surprise me if it was. So of, of one thing of note is that, especially in this formulation, in this delivery as tea bags, when it's made available in this form, you have several advantages. You have that it comes in a predetermined amount. You have a tea bag where you have a predetermined amount. Um, you, you have an, an adequate label um, that tells you, okay, this is how much you should take per day. Um, the water extraction, is another important thing because a tea bag you will have to boil that in water um, unless somebody crazy comes along and puts it into 
even if you put it into milk, I don't know who would do, do that, but who knows? Some people are out there. Um, huh. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> um, uh, even if you, if you do that, uh, to avoid some of the, uh, of the, of the bitter taste, you might add sugar or something like that, you, you know, I mean, that's actually done in the, in the traditional setting as well. You, you yeah. wrap it into sugar, the, the leaf and, 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 mm -hmm. uh, do that. Uh, but, um, I, I think that are, that are important. And with the water extraction, you obviously get very different, a very different profile of extraction than even if you use orange juice, orange juice is very acidic. Um, so you, you get already a very different profile of extraction. And we have done some of that work um, where we have done different extractions. We have done water extraction, we've done methanol extraction, ethanol extraction, all that stuff. And what you see in most of the research actually what is done is methanol extraction. So you get a different profile of, uh, of the alkaloids that are being extracted. Um, so there you already have one, one difference. Yeah, and if I could say, the one thing that's been on my mind recently is the comparison in a more of a historical and less scientific sense of Kratom with coffee. Um, recently, I've been watching or, or listening to uh, Box 1730, the coffee cantata, and I'm not, or cantana, if, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the story, but it's a, a mini opera that Bach wrote back in the 1730s about a coffee house um, in Germany, and it was highly stigmatized at the time. Drinking coffee was considered to be a satanic activity. And this is a, an opera about a husband or a father who um, threatens to take away his daughter's right to marry because she keeps going to this coffee house and drinking this drink. And he just cannot understand it. It's satanic to him. It's a, it's a stimulant or it's a, it's a drug. It's, it's, I mean, it's less, um, um, you know, less specific than drug at that time is satanic. Um, and, and with that comparison and going forward, you know, there's the coffee has also developed a lot from the time of, of just pounding, grinding it up in a mortar and pestle, mixing it with water and then drinking the grinds to the point where we have ristrettos that we make double chocolate macchiatos and the flavor is no longer an issue. People are able to derive the benefits they want from coffee um, and, and get and, and still have a flavor that they enjoy. And it's also been able to shun its social stigmati stigmatization, the, the, the normative condemning attitude that it had um, back whenever it was, you know, first making the rounds of Europe. Um, and I just see so many historical similarities between, between Kratom and, and coffee in that sense. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm sure. And I should say for the record that I also think that coffee has such a terrible flavor that I won't drink coffee. So maybe I'm just like unusually uh, sensitive to bitter drinks. But uh, yeah, but I'll, I'll drink tea. Um, so yeah, I think that this is a, a really interesting way of, of getting the most benefit out of the plant. Um, and so in terms of the survey, back to the survey, what, uh, what specific things are you going to be asking people and what do you hope to find? So especially since basically we have a predetermined dose, uh, this will be the first time that a survey will actually be able to uh, examine that in particular. Uh, so we will be looking again, uh, as we did with prior surveys, at the primary use of, uh, of Kratom, if there is a particular use for which folks are, are using um, Kratom, it, for example, for pain or for uh, a, uh, a, a condition uh, such as uh, depressive disorder or anxiety disorder, PTSD or like, or even for an opioid withdrawal, a mitigating opioid withdrawal or other uh, prescription or illicit um, uh, drug uh, uh, symptoms. Um, we also will be looking obviously at typical demographic data. Um, we also want to know um, how they uh, first uh, heard about Kratom, so very common issues, but we also especially want to know what additional benefits they derive from using it and what adverse effects uh, they experienced with the use, if any. Um, and uh, also, if they have been using other drugs 
either concomitantly or before, and if they have any diagnosed health conditions um, uh, that uh, they uh, uh, that they experienced, um, uh, and if they experienced a benefit in general from using quantum with these health conditions. And, and are you going to be distributing it through the university website or like how can people find the survey if they want to participate? So uh, we will be uh, distributing it through this Qualtrics server. It will be a unique link uh, that folks can be clicking on and then be redirected uh, to directly to the survey uh, website. Uh, and it is, uh, I think, Sir, and you can explain a little yes. bit better how it will be distributed. <laughs> yeah, so we, we will be um, putting QR codes on the back of our next round of T's of about a thousand to yeah, roughly a thousand um, packs of um, 24 tea bags will be going out um, with this QR code on it to this unique link um, that people can fill out the survey. Um, it kind of like the back of a cereal box in a way where you scan it with your phone, get taken to the uh, appropriate website, and then everything's, um, as Grunman assured, um, anonymous from that point forward. Great. And, and what about people that are just experimenting with it? Because I imagine that the majority of, I actually don't know what the answer, but I would guess at least the majority of people that I know that have used it don't use it for any particular thing. They're kind of just curious about what is this? Is it useful? Can I integrate this into my life as maybe an alternative to coffee or an alternative to alcohol or what, mm -hmm. or do I use it after I exercise? Do I use it before I exercise? What is the, the purpose of this stuff? I mean, I imagine there's a lot of people in the United States because it's new that don't even have uh, sort of predetermined motivations and are just using it in a sort of experimental way without really knowing what to make of it. Is that incorporated into the survey at all? So we will definitely have a, uh, uh, in addition to uh, uh, how did you find out about Kratom, we will have basically a, uh, a question about have you used it before or is this a first time experience? And then we will have a section about what has been your experience with using Kratom and also still derive benefits and adverse effects, if any. And we, we want to tickle out, uh, tackle out, whatever you want to call it, um, how do longer term users compare to relatively new users of Kratom? Uh, that is one objective for this, um, especially since we have such a good uh, idea from this particular group um, in terms of dosing amount and then also frequency, we can calculate very well how much kratom is consumed. Uh, so that is one of, of, uh, of our primary objectives, I would say. Sounds interesting. Yeah, we're really looking forward to um, pushing this survey through. Um, Sam and I, Top Tree, we're just both so profoundly grateful for being able to, one, facilitate such an incredible educational, um, well-rounded conversation as this, as well as be able to promote, um, you know, further research into the science of, you know, creative use patterns. And, you know, we're, we're, eager to um to to find out more about the the kratom tea drinkers as well so um we're just so profoundly grateful to be able to um help you push your work forward and um hamilton thank you so much for um participating in this conversation as well um thank you this was wonderful thank you all right well okay i'm happy to share it in any way that it could be beneficial to you all and um and yeah I, i'm excited to see i'm i am pretty confident that the results are, well, I guess it's biasing, but I'm, I would imagine the results will be pretty uh, positive because it just seems like it's the safest way to consume it other than maybe chewing fresh leaves. So um, yeah, it's, it'll be exciting to see what happens. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited as well. Uh, like I said, it's the first time that we can actually do like a, a real a, a dose set dose kind of and, and frequency uh, and and we will look at 
a couple of aspects in regards to uh, overall health on a, on a sliding scale and pain. What is their current pain status? Um, so there will be there will be quite a few correlations uh, and associations that we can potentially draw uh, from it. Uh, now we we have to see a little bit how we can look at uh, frequency of, so longer term Kratom users versus new Kratom users, uh, because some of them who have not used it that long before this particular product might have used other Kratom products before. So, you know, we have to we have to see how we kind of balance that the best way mm -hmm. um, uh, in this study. And you have some products that are flavored, right? So you have some that are um, like cinnamon flavored or have some flavors in it um, versus Passion fruit, you know, peach, vanilla. Yeah. So we have to, we have to see, because this is something that I haven't really seen before on the market. Um, so that is different from, you know, some, because most of them are just sold as powders. Uh, so there's no flavor to them that overcomes the bitter taste that is inherent to Kratom. Yeah, I must say that the the new blends and the flavors, I've I've been finally I've been able to taste all of them. And there's the the astringent uh, aspect that Hamilton is so fond of mentioning um, <laughs> is absent in so many ways. Um, it, it's 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 a whole new experience. And yeah, I'm I'm very interested and have an open mind in seeing how that affects people's response in the survey as well. Yeah. Well, I'm also looking forward to analyzing them, actually, uh, in terms of their alkaloid content, at least the mitragynin content. And um, still, this rincofilin is kind of the the mystery, kind of hopefully adds a little bit of a puzzle piece that we can put things together with the C. elegans, the kind of rhabditis uh, elegans worms. Um, we, we <laughs> It's funny because COVID-19 has created uh, a, uh, a, a unique problem. We can't get morphine as a positive control in, in the worms. Uh, our collaborator in the Netherlands cannot get, for whatever reason, morphine um, currently. Um, and so we, we cannot run the positive controls at the moment. Uh, so we hope That's to good. have the Yeah, at least not on the on the legal market. I don't know about ah. the black market, but um, <laughs> We, we're not we're not going there yet, at least. So uh, we're still trying legal avenues. We tried we tried actually loperamide uh, in the beginning, uh, but loperamide is just not it's not providing the same responses that we're seeking as morphine, which does make sense. Uh, um, but we'll, we'll have to see. We have to wait for that a little bit. But we're testing rincofilin in the worms uh, as a for pumping mechanisms that seems to be similar to um, opioid. Um, suppression of respiratory rate in the worms. Um, okay. So we're looking for that at the moment, but we can't we can't do anything unless we have an actual positive control to compare it to. Right. Unfortunately. Wow. wow, that's interesting. Yeah. Well, wish you best of luck with that. I'm really excited to um, see if there's also the survey and all the other work that you're doing um, in the future. Um, I've got a Google Scholar notification set for your name. Um, and I recommend <laughs> everyone else that listens to this sets theirs as well. Um, it's great content. Well, it was a pleasure talking to, to both of you. Uh, nice meeting you. Uh, and uh, yeah, all the best. Stay safe during these uncertain times. Uh, let's hope yes. we can get back to normal somehow. Absolutely. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Have a great day, everyone. Bye, everybody. Mm -hmm. Bye.